morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you all here again. Well, we've had an interesting time, and we've traded ideas, we've traded thoughts, <coughs> coming up with new ideas, trying to bring subjects together. What I want to do for the next sort of hour, or just under three quarters of an hour perhaps, is to have a little look at something I've been doing over the last two or three years uh, with an enormous amount of encouragement from my own senior management within the school and the college to look at better ways of teaching science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics type subjects, particularly focusing on the computing sort of field. But I think, having been challenged several times by some of my colleagues, that it actually fits into and other subjects. So although it's focused on STEM, I think there are lessons we can learn uh, across almost all of our subjects. In terms of actually getting quite spectacularly high levels of achievement out of our students, levels which actually surprise them. They didn't know they could be that good. Here's a link, you'll be able to see, the, get the presentation uh, later on, probably this evening. Uh, I'll post it up on my University of Derby version of the website. And you'll be able to get hold of the PDF version. And that's the link that's actually in the schedule to a shortish document that documents my journey, journey over the last three years in ways of developing approaches that get engagement from students at levels that we often don't see, we love to have. So the structure of the next 45 minutes or so is a little bit of a look at the context in the STEM and particularly the computing sort of field. Look at one or two of the critical issues that we are finding from those outside higher education about our students, our graduates. I want to think a little bit about pedagogy, the way we look at ourselves, reflect back what I said this time last year here. I will then pose a few thoughts and questions and we'll open it up to the floor for a discussion for a little while. So we can do some self-reflection about our styles in our subjects and see whether some of these approaches allow us to do, achieve even better with our students or to reflect around the right way to allow our students, with our guidance, to achieve much better results than they ever believed that they could do. Now, we know that the type of students we're getting <coughs> are changing. With, in some respects, we are seeing a true millennialality, millennial sort of nature of our students. <coughs> even though they are technically de uh, dependent, but also technically incompetent in terms of using IT by and large. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them. But they want us to respond to them and make life engaging. They aren't the traditional ones that some of the older ones of us here, who went and sat in a great big lecture theater, and somewhere down the far end there, there was a bloke or a woman, a lecturer, professor teaching, Chalkboardings were going like this all the time, very little looking at us, and they just gave us notes. Well, we had to take lots and lots and lots of notes. Now, that doesn't work nowadays. Our students will not respond to that. They want us to respond to them as they are, as millennials, videos, multimedia, multi-mechanisms, multi-everything multitasking even. <coughs> On the other side, we have the employers out there looking at our students and saying, where are all those soft skills that we need? Where is that ability to communicate? Where is that ability to be curious, to be creative? But the millennials are telling us that traditional approach to teaching teaching, filling empty buckets. It's boring for them. They don't have a boredom threshold at all. It's like a, a boredom threshold is almost, for most of our students, is about as long as an, a goldfish, three seconds or so. We know that traditional education, in, certainly in STEM, 
really doesn't develop soft skills at all. And often they deliver fairly middle of the road levels of achievement and grades and so on. And in the computing field, one of our biggest problems is that the software packages are changing incredibly fast. I was at a, was a round table discussion about a year ago, and one of the academics there who taught a particular software package was observing that he was getting incredibly stressed because the package changed every three to four months. And as he taught that, <coughs> that particular module using that particular software, he needed to, to get more training because he was teaching a different version of the software every three months. This was, I can't cope with it. I've got to learn all the details so I can be the expert and guide my students. And I'm getting worn out by going on training courses every three months to learn about the next version so I can teach them properly. Huge stress levels in the academic community for that. And that could apply to whether it's architecture where you're using computer-aided design packages or in the mechanical engineering and so on, if your packages are changing so fast. And if you have the belief that you need to be on top of the fine detail of the package that your students are learning. Now, this middle graph picture here is rather fun. It came from um, an English organization uh, in partnership with the statistical analysis system people, SAS, who are based in the USA. And they kind of sort of separated out the types of skills that industry needs our graduates to have in the field of big data analytics, analytics, data science. The usual sort of subject-related technicalities. In this one, it's particular things like maths and statistics, um, data and technical skills, and so on. Now, if you could take this for any of our subjects here, whether it's literature, theology, whatever, and put your own topic-related skills there, subject-related skills, and it's all going to be the same. But what business was saying this half there, the things that to the employers is absolutely critical, we're not delivering those very well. Things like creativity, curiosity, how does the world work? What's going on? As that lovely presentation we just had about does Wagner or Keynes apply? particularly post-2008, where all the macroeconomic models in the world have broken and no one in eight years has recreated the ma these models. This is bizarre. It has never happened before. Even if the models broke every 10 years, which they did, they were reconstructed pretty quickly. What happened now? No one has a clue at macroeconomic levels. That's technical. People need that curiosity. Should we? We're trying to engender curiosity in all of our students, and it's kind of hard work at times. But still, somehow our school system takes these immensely curious little three and four and five-year-olds, and somehow by the time they've got to 18, and they come to us as at, um, higher education or further education, that curiosity been beaten out of them mostly. So we now have to put it back into them to be useful for the business world, to be useful for the academic world. We need to develop problem solving capabilities. Don't give them the answer. They need to be able to work together. We all work in teams in academia. Our students need to learn to do that as well. They need to be able to communicate, whether it's in writing, or in speaking, or in giving presentations. And then, this, word, this phrase that I mentioned on Tuesday, storytelling, is finding that way to take all those amazing numbers of ideas you've got in your head and condensing it down for this particular presentation into three, perhaps, uh, points that are really important 
that you can then start at the beginning with a context, a little summary, tell that compelling story to the conclusion, persuading your audience, your management team, and those around you that this is the right approach, you've chosen the right me uh, mechanisms, methodologies, and here is the answer, in a sense, in this particular context, which is relevant for your employment or your employer. Now these skills are not normally part of every single module in the STEM subject course. Yes, we have a communications module, perhaps, or we may have a group project which covers some of those things. But if you only address these issues <coughs> in one module, in one each year, or in one year only, that's 35 contact hours out of whatever three years' worth it works out at. It's not surprising that the students don't develop that, so we have to put this into every single module. Reinforcement. What we really want to achieve with our students is to get them to become enthusiastic. How many of your students are really enthusiastic folks all the time? Not many. Try, there may be ways you can find that will help you to get more of them enthusiastic. We find a lot of lack of engagement. Students who turn up once or twice in a module. And in many forms of uh, pedagogy and teaching, we know there's a very, very high correlation between attendance and, uh, shall we say, the grade that they going to achieve. But we need to find ways <coughs> of developing this greater uh, engagement. We need to be able to drive the levels of achievement higher and higher. Not random sort of ordinary just grade inflation where we just move the grades up like that and hope that they don't get scaled back and renormalized. We've got to get true improvement in, in um, the achievement level. But I'm more and more and more interested now in driving everything I do around improving the employability of our students. In North America and certainly in the UK, students now pay for their education, their higher education, with government loans and so on. So the better the employment we can help them to achieve, uh, uh, Require, in a sense, the better they're going to, or quicker they're going to be able to pay off their loans and become freestanding. So we want to look for employment. We also need now, because things are changing so fast, they can't rely on what they learned when they were 19, 20, 21, 22 to carry them through the rest of their life. The thing that is most important they learn how to learn. They learn how to find an appropriate answer in a particular context. So we're looking at, and the work I've been doing and leading is really focused around, yeah, we're going to deliver the technical capabilities, but we're going to drive the whole process through soft skills, learning, learning to learn, and almost no teaching. Now we know there's a divide within the academic community, and you see often, particularly in the older uh, academics, they are most comfortable knowing that they are the domain expert. They know it all, they've got everything that needs to go into the heads of their students, and they are going to use every second of the scheduled contact time to pour that knowledge and everything else into their heads. And we also know, by and large, that 
teaching and lectures and such like aren't actually terribly effective. There is an alternative view of life, which actually makes us as academics much, much, much more valuable in many respects, both to our university, our institution, and also, and more importantly, to our students. Change your view of yourself from, yeah, I've got a PhD in this incredibly narrow little subject, and I am the world expert in Wagnerian versus Keynesian economics, models for Nigeria. It's a nice thing to have, but don't hang the rest of your academic life on that PhD. Become a learning to learn expert, to guide and mentor your undergraduates, your masters and postgraduate researchers working for you and with you. <coughs> Teach them how to learn. Encourage them how to find the questions. Encourage them how to connect the questions in a particular context to everything they have ever learned before. Because the answer to a particular question will change almost every week or every month or every year because the context changes. If you move from one company <coughs> to another as a consultant, the context in that company is different to the context in that company. If you are, some of your graduates are going to become consultants for the big four consultancy companies. What they need to be able to do is not to come in and say, I know the answer for you or I know the answer for you, because they don't. Consultants like that are not good for your business. They're not good for your university either. They need to come and say, you have got all the knowledge. I will help you to explore your situation and come to your answer. So this is why we need to teach questions, <coughs> not answers. In all of our subject areas, we need to be teaching the students how to work their way through questions that we give them in the context of today's knowledge, the context of the commentaries written over the last 500 years, if we're doing, say, theology, whether it's Christian theology, Muslim theology, Buddhist theology, it doesn't really matter. Those things change over time, and we need to get our students able to critically evaluate what's going on over time in this particular context, or that context, comparing contexts. Teach questions, because they don't change. If I look at my own subject area, <coughs> worked in the field of IT and systems and things like that for the last 40, 45 years, the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves or the chief, um, chief information officers, chief systems officers, security officers, all of those guys that are fundamentally asking the same question as we were asking when I was a systems analyst in 1975. The questions have not changed. The answers, they change in every company and every, every other year or so. The technology changes. So the specific, implementable answer is different. We need to get our students to that level. So how do we go about doing it? Take Plutarch's view from two and a half thousand years ago. Education is not about filling these rather leaky buckets, the heads of our students. But education is about inspiring that desire to learn, inspiring enthusiasm, lighting those fires. And so what we've been doing now in one of our programs at Derby, for our particular couple, two or three modules, where actually we are teaching, supposedly, <coughs> how to program. We don't do that. We don't provide formal software training at all. 
We give them access to software, to the case study materials, the exercises, all sorts of things, and some, we provide some computer-based computer tests so that they can make sure they have learned the technicalities. We also, in terms of the work they do in the assessment, provide them some fairly broad, big challenges. So they have to then negotiate and research to find a narrow, small part of that that they can actually achieve. And it also links to another of the, the more interesting uh, pedagogical ideas around at the moment is students as co-producers. And in one area, I've, some of the areas I'm working in, I don't do research. I presented a little short presentation at Derby uh, a year or so back in a research seminar which was entitled, Why I Don't Do Research. Brackets. My students do it for me. So, change of, there's a little bit of a change of philosophy to, the, shall we say, the traditional one, which would be an hour's lecture about the syntax of some part of a software package. We provide some use cases and examples, and we give some, them some worked examples, and then the workshop would follow up with, here are some examples or some work that will be good for you, will help you to reinforce your learning from my lecture that I just gave you. And in that, the tutor at the workshop will be asked by the student, well, I've got a problem here, What's the, how do I do it? But expecting the answer. This is what you need. You should have put the comma there, or semicolon there, or full stop there, or uh, whatever. And very often, the assessment is very, very tightly defined. And if it's building a chunk of code, uh, an artifact, as we call it, then it will be demonstrated face to face or maybe just submit your code and I will inspect it to find out whether it's good programming practice or so on. And the whole way through, it's all very, very artificial. Here is a database I, the professor, created for you uh, last week of 50 rows or 20 columns or something. All totally disconnected from any form of reality. And we can see that whether in almost all of our subject areas. And I saw one a few weeks ago uh, where someone was at a user group conference saying, well, I'm coming at SAS from a <coughs> statistician's perspective. So I give them this little tiny table of data, and I tell them they've got to do the t-test and the ANOVA and the something else, and it will come out with the right answers. And if they get this number there, that number there, that number there, tick, 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 and I've assessed their work, in three seconds flat. Makes my life easy. They've all got the same exercise, they're all doing the same numbers crunching, and they are bored out of their skulls, as you can begin to imagine, because it doesn't relate to anything that they're doing. <laughs> and Stu's the WTF, but this is a little article, little sort of cartoon that I, there is outside one of my colleagues. <clears throat> He's a games sort of programmer. And this typifies the difference between the subject expert, the domain expert, who absolutely loves the mathematician mathematics, is gorgeous to them. And yes, some of our students love the beauty of mathematics or something. And then you've got this kid here. Hey, I just wanted to learn how to program video games. I don't want to know the mathematics that fit behind the transforms that do whatever. We have to be very sensitive to the type of university we're at, the type of our students, and whether they do want the beautiful maths, or whether they want to just apply the stuff where they don't need to understand the maths, they need to just know how to use the gadget, and to know the strengths and the weaknesses of that particular gadget. It might be a hardware gadget, it might be a software gadget, who knows? So they need to know the context in which to use it. They need to know what answers it can help so what questions it can help to answer. So what we are looking at, and this answers that colleague who was stressed by learn, relearning his software package every three months because he knew he had to be the expert in it to guide his students. No, you don't. I, t I use a package from IBM called Bluemix, which has over 100 applications in it. 
Now, there is no way that I am going to know how to use every single one of those 100 packages. All I need to know is what each one of them broadly does, or that cluster does. I have absolutely no need, no inclination, to know what each one of those does. What I need to be able to do is within the challenge that I set the students, that I can guide them, yeah, well, you ought to be looking at that one and that one because you've got the answer, uh, sort of an explanation as to why they should look at that lot rather than that lot. And then they go off and learn how to use that particular package. And there are videos out there on YouTube, from IBM, from all sorts of other places. Or for the different packages that we use, there's YouTubes everywhere. That is how they need to learn. Because that's what's going to happen when they get out into the big wide world. Our third year students spend a year on an internship in computing. And they will be presented with different software packages that they've not seen at the university. And they have a short time to become productive. The companies are normally small, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and they don't have a thousand pounds a day to pour into courses for their interns. So they're pointed to where the learning materials are. Just go find, go fix, go learn. That's learning how to learn to learn for the life, for your future. And we teach them with questions and questions and questions and questions. Very rarely do I give them a straight answer. Prompt them to reflect and think further. And in terms of that assessment to drive that re and reinforce soft skills, much of our assessment now, all the way through from first year through to final year, you know, they have to do the technical work, sure. But the assessment in these three, four, five modules that I'm thinking of, the assessment is a critical reflection, typically, mostly uh, on our, my program, in terms of video or PowerPoint with voiceover. <coughs> You have a clear structure of what they must achieve. They don't present us with the, a walkthrough of the software. Now this has some interesting side benefits as well. Even if they don't end up delivering an enormous amount as a technical result, as long as their critical reflection explains why they failed, that's great. Because not every analytics project is going to be successful in the work business. Your data may not support the insights you need. So you, the fact that you've done it and you understand why that didn't work, that's great. We did this last year. I let, helped a colleague who is the project program uh, module leader, and we picked up this new uh, IBM stuff, what's, an, uh, and what's an analytics and blue mix. We got an IBM guy to come in, he's a brilliant guy, and he gave three little workshops, about three hours th on three days. That's the thing that has around about 100 packages in it. And this is a magical way of getting students to see insights in big data fairly quickly. All we said, in essence, for their assessment was that. We gave them some rubrics which told them how we're going to assess the presentation, which is a 15-minute PowerPoint presentation, a critical reflection, <coughs> and they had to put a voice over it. Now, essentially, that's a whole spec, apart from the rubric. Oh, they had to, oh this is the other part. They had to do a little research-based um, article explaining what they were planning to do, even if they did something different later on. But 60% of the grade for a final year module came from this 15-minute presentation, which they submitted as a PowerPoint over with voiceover to turn it in. Out of the 20, 25 
presentation which we had uh, submitted. Currently, four out of the top five are available at this link. One of them, interestingly, not from Derby, but from our partner um, university college in Bangladesh, in Dakar, scored 95%. It was spectacular. And you can go see those, and IBM are now part, sort of using those as examples, exemplars of the sort of things that students can do with this incredibly free style, learn how to learn, and then do something interesting. Um, now, I'm not going to spend too long, but I thought some of these comments from the students are kind of interesting. Because these are from students who have been work I've been working with, they've been working with me now for basically three years or so. <coughs> and they kind of find this approach, this freedom, go find the interesting thing, is very, very interesting. I mean, sometimes the third year students come straight in from outside, from another, say, from Qatar. And they, for the first semester, it's, ouch, not quite sure how to cope with this sort of freedom. Where's the guidance? And the guidance they want is the sort that we think of from the traditional side. But when they get the guidance of how to be free, creative, they love it. And they deliver some of the best work as well, which is lovely to see. I'm looking for novelty. I want that left field idea connected to the right field idea in ways that nobody's ever done before that traditionally we'd expect the PhD student or a, a long in the tooth research uh, academic to come up with. No, I get this from third years, from second years. But also a lot of formative input. You see, the consequence of being a learning to learn expert rather than a content expert, a domain expert, is I can use all 36 hours of my scheduled contact time for one module to help them to learn. I see we'll probably spend three to six minutes with each student each week in one-to-one -one discussions, if they want it. And if they don't, then some other people benefit by getting 10 minutes on a one-to-one. -one each week. That has some really fun results. And by using this formative approach, and I do it with those articles, those sort of written things, typically four weeks before submission, no, content, no scheduled contact time with a seminar, you come through my office, <coughs> you submitted your, the, the final draft version of your assignment, I'll turn it in so I can annotate it in a formative fashion show you what your grade currently is, or if it's a really disastrous sort of, they've only just got started, at least give them two marks. This is what it's like now, which is kind of, oh dear, it's in the 30s perhaps. But the content in terms of novelty, the ideas that are coming from, you're connecting from different places, that shows you the potential. So they all get two grades. The potential, based on the, the, the novelty and the, brilliance of the connecting weird and wondrous things, and then where it actually is. And then four weeks later, they'll having taken account of those um, formative feedback comments, they'll submit the final summative. Now the interesting thing is, the first few times you do this, the improvement between formative level <coughs> and final level is between 10 and 15 percentage points. Can be as high as 20 points. By the time you've had them for, I've had them for three years, the difference is about five, ten percent. And uh, one of them this year managed to get ahead of the game, got a 95 percent at the formative review stage, so she didn't need to resubmit, well, she had to technically resubmit it, but she didn't have to touch it. You know, you're looking at, do it, if you do a formative, you, so depending on the, the numbers of students you've got, you know, it might be two weeks worth of um, shed, uh, seminars and lectures you cancel so you can sort of speed them through at 10 minute intervals. Do I care? Because I'm not 
giving them content. I'm mentoring them. I'm developing their ideas. Or should I say, I'm helping them develop their ideas. Contact time is for helping the students to learn. That's why with learning the SAS system, it's 35 hours worth roughly of teaching time, and I ha can't afford to use 36 hours of lecture time and workshop time to teach them SAS. They can go and do that in their self-study time. You do that for all sorts of things. If there are good resources out there where it's already written down, or it's already there as a YouTube video, why should I, why should we represent that? Tell them it's there, or even better, tell them it's somewhere out there. Go find. Then we can use our time and their time to do much, much more interesting things. So, for the next few minutes, these are the areas that I think I would like you part of this workshop to share your ideas, reflect upon what you're doing and how you could use this <coughs> in your own subject area. Over to you ladies and gentlemen. to have them in, your, in our offices so that they could get formative assessment, however helpful they are. Um, and and, and it's, um, we are teachers, we are humans at the end of the day, and you are awake till 2 a.m., 3 a.m., preparing the lectures, and then you give the lectures, um, and, and to your horror, you find they're on Facebook. How do you deal with it? And, Good comments. Now, are you at the beginning of your teaching career, aren't you? Mm. So, kind of, I can understand a little bit why you're up there till two or three at night. <laughs> One of the consequences of what I do here with this approach is that for a typical module week's worth of work, which is a could be up to three or four hours, maybe a two-hour seminar and a two-hour workshop, there are eight slides kind of like that. And that includes the title pet slide as well. So the title slide and then a little context for the, the week's ideas. Kind of a bit like that. And then there will be, if it's a, if it's a two hour, two hour, there would be time to have three critical, really significant questions on that subject area. And this, that two hours would then be split up into a, maybe a 20, 15 minutes of a context which is based around what those topic areas and what I read over the last week or two in the business and technical presses. So, it would, again, that 15, 20 minutes would be based around one or two slides like that. And then there will be three slides which will just say, this is a really important question. And then once they've got going, they will, and the first, first lecture series or seminar like that will have one slide that follows that and says, go find, because I'm doing it online, or sorry, that they are online all the time in the lab, or given we've got Wi-Fi everywhere, and they've got EduRobe or whatever, they can get out and they are required to find five interesting, good sources which they can put into their working bibliography to build up for the module. 
They're then given about 15 minutes to find those and think a little bit about what's in those articles or sources. And then they have a about five, 10 minutes to have a small discussion with the colleagues around them. And then we would have a five, 10 minute plenary feedback from the various groups. Then the, because I launch assignments right at the beginning of the semester, I don't sort of del deliver one at week three and one at week eight. I give them everything right at the beginning. And so the workshop that follows one or two hours, is apply those ideas, those three big questions, into this part of your assignment. So there I am, four hours worth of contact time, and might be an hour's worth of work at the outset. And if I look back to what I did when I taught completely different types of subject areas, and suddenly we pick up, um, say, um, <coughs> an MS, um, MSc module in managing change. If I were to build those mod that module now, I would get, the, assuming someone had found the textbook for me or we knew what the textbook was, what you have to do is really sort of chop it up into sort of eight or 10, 12 weeks worth of work, say 10 for the sake of argument, and identify three big, big fundamental questions in each of those 10 topic areas. And yeah, you've done a, if you've done a PhD, you're you've already learned how to read or uh, strip a book really quickly. I mean, most of us, if we get a, a book on approval from a publisher, we know within five to 10 minutes, A, whether that book is of any value to us at all and our students, what the critical questions are in the field in that book, you've done the work to build most of a module, unless you want to have those slides full, full, full of words. Now, if you're going to get them full, full, full of words, then yes, you're going to be up till 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock at night. Now, it's kind of a bit scary because you're doing something hugely different to what you received as a student which is what you kind of think of is what we should be doing when we turn to the other end. But I can assure you it works. And this bit, learning analytics, which I mentioned on, Monday, on Tuesday, that chapter that I kind of use the first par couple paragraphs for. If we look at all the numbers that come out of our marking across the portfolios and everything else and the attendance figures and so on, then we can begin, and most of the data comes for free. It's very, very easy to get that. And then you, you, kind of have to do, you don't actually have to do complicated statistics. All you basically need for most of this is, what's the average, the mean, the arithmetic mean, what's the standard deviation that tells you how it's or wide it is. Ah, kind of, with the numbers we've got here, that's around all you need. You wouldn't need to do those things that the lady before us uh, was talking about, that proved whether Wagner was going that way or that way, and so on. So, the other thing that came out of it, and it's particularly true at the final year, we do think of engagement as being important, that attendance is important, because we've already learned that in the traditional sort of approach, there is a strong correlation. With this approach, the only correlation I can see at the moment, subject a little bit more work, is did they attend the formative review? If they attended the formative review session, they get great marks. Did they attend? Half of them didn't, half of the time. And they still got great marks. I mean, and the variation, I mean, there may be a three or four percent difference. I don't know, but I couldn't care less about three or four percent. I'm only interested in tens and 15 and 20 percent, because that's half, that's great. And if, if, if attendance <coughs> at all the seminars gives them an extra five percent, that's not terribly significant. It gives them three percent. That's not. There's no point in worrying about that. No point in chasing the students if they are capable of. If they will come to that formative review, and that gets them, allows them to deliver by the formative review session that 70, 80 percent boundary uh, band assignment. That's not bad. But it depends crucially on how you go about things. 
Yeah, I'm sitting back and looking at the presentation. I just said this is wonderful and the, the way of dealing. But then I had the opportunity to teach in a development country. I teach in a developed country UK. And I was a lecturer in Ghana that is a purely the developed before I got there. I quickly had to adjust and it became easy for me to manage my students and to go around because of the systems developed around the United Kingdom. You mentioned something like Wi-Fi and other things. Oh, yeah. That facilitated everything. Certain times, I just put a question and I tell students, A, B, C, D. You can find this in hand. Something I have learned, but there is no way I can carry that back to the Interesting. It's interesting you say that. I've taught in Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, uh, up until around about 2012. And when I was last taught in Botswana, the total broadband connectivity into Botswana was one gigabyte. <laughs> the University of Derby has two gigabytes, each big gig bits each way. So I know what you're talking about. <coughs> this approach, okay. They can't quite do it online quite so much, but I was teaching a master's level, and so the students came with heads full of case studies. I didn't need to give them a 20-page case study, which is kind of, ultimately, not very valuable, <coughs> compared with their 10,000-page case studies they held in their head, that we all hold in our heads. And we got them to work together so they would farm out in groups of four working together. Now, the research that they could do through sort of the online libraries and so on. And this approach in terms of teaching the questions, research-based, applying to the assignment which you see right at the beginning. And I was teaching in block teaching, so three days solid teaching for a module. And then they had, the students had a week, a month to do the assignment which was really apply these ideas from this module, say managing change or something like that, into your situation. And so the principles will work there. Now, as it happens, this was done, I built those, many of those modules back in 2004-05 before I developed this really stripped down approach. But I would still use, I would use, prefer to use the stripped down approach now than the rather more slides that I had back then, and it works. Both in developing and in developed. Yeah. The only different, real difference is, as you say, is connectivity in developed. Yeah, that was only one aspect that I was covering, and you really took that aspect. Yeah. The second aspect that I find is the contact time. The contact time, because when you are teaching, there is the possibility you identify, you should be able to identify your students, know their levels individually. But it greatly becomes a challenge in our part, some part of our, uh, our world, where you have larger numbers. Now, the challenge is that we tend to say, that, okay, we can put them in groups. But you need an effective system to be able to go through the groups because the, young, the weaker ones there can be submerged. Yeah. And so we have it. Did probably I've seen some people trying to ask questions. So if I want to finish every of mine, I'll be good. But what I'm trying to say is that we have a series of challenges that you can, you, you, when you cross one bridge, the other one becomes in. And so this is a process that you have given that looks so good. So, and that is learning because you need to learn to learn. You shouldn't take yourself as a master. Yeah. You can learn from your students. <coughs> but then the challenges continue coming up I'm quickly to finish up with what she just said. The UK system, probably for me, can say that the university system requires the student to attend. They design the models, they, they follow a pattern, and you have just one, it's something like 45 minutes. And within that 45 minutes, students are supposed to attend. And it's a, a requirement. So you see that the system has been built for you. Probably you have you have lived uh, probably. Well, I reckon I have fifty percent attendance most of the time. No, what I'm trying to say is that you have lived and you have uh, that uh, like you, know, like you talk about two hours, two hours.
two hours. Or, or it could be one hour and one hour. Uh -huh. second, and second year and final year is one hour, one hour. Uh -huh. But hours is you may not have that opportunity. Well, if, it depends on whether, I mean, if you have only large lecture approach, then you've got a problem. Uh -huh. It's not going to work very well. What you have That's to do, you've got to have at least the ability to have, for me, I think, to be, to, my adv strong advice is you must have a workshop type or tutorial that goes along where you're in <coughs> no more than 20 students for an hour section. If you can do that, this will work. If your numbers or processes are such that you've only got this big 300 students for one hour lecture, this is, you're going to have to find ways of handling some of this in a very, very different way. But as long as you can get them into groups of 20 for an hour, then pretty much this system will work. <coughs> because you then do your formative reviews during the one hour plus one hour. And OK, so you're doing 20 in an hour, well, no, you won't. So you have to have two, you'll just give up two weeks' worth of lectures and, and so on. And again, many, many organize, and this works for assignment-based, coursework-based assessment, not exam. And again, some cultures, some countries, you have to have exam, in which case, this kind of approach, there's going to be problems. Because you can't do that formative to final um, improvement. <coughs> the lady behind. Oh, sorry. Um, thoughts and questions. Well, I have a, a thought here. I have a daughter. Um, she's she's now in med, med, she's going to go to medical school next year. And when I, I brought her up, I, I used to tell her because I didn't know how to bring her up, you know, to be part of my child's life. So she was my best student ever in my life. So I, I told her since she was a little girl, since she was about thirteen until she left my house at eighteen to go to university, I used to tell her every year to write an essay for me on patterns. See everything for yourself. Tell me what you think. What's the pattern? And last year, when she was at second year university, she came and said, thank you, Dad. Yeah, I can well believe that. It's a nice one. It's nice for your child. Part of what we need you. to do is learn to see the patterns in life. And that That's helps it. us to become even more inquisitive. We have to draw stumps so that the next person can uh, come in and start talking. So thank you all very much. Um, Thank you.